Hey guys, thanks for being with us this morning. We appreciate you taking your time to hang out with us. Um, in the recent events in society with the safer at home mandate and the social distancing, business are closing down, uh, schools have let out, but we just wanna let you know that Harvest Point's still doing ministry. And we are starting to understand that the church doesn't have four walls. Uh, we're still studying the Bible here. Uh, we're still proclaiming God's word. Uh, your elders are still meeting and uh, praying together. We're still trying to come up with creative, interactive ways to uh, see one another and study the Bible together. And so we just wanted to fill you in on that and say thank you for watching. And we also want to invite you to come and hang out with us when all the social distancing and the uh, safer at home mandates up. up. Come hang out with us, come worship with us, because even though we are very thrilled that you're, you're spending your time uh, watching the sermon today, um, that's really just supposed to be supplemental to your worship at a local church. And so we just wanna encourage you to get involved in a local church and plug in and worship there and serve there. And if you don't have a local church, come hang out with us and uh, plug in here, serve with us, worship with us, and once again, just thank you for watching this morning, and uh, we pray that you'll be blessed by the message. Hey, good morning, church. Happy Easter, happy Resurrection Day. I apologize that y'all had to see that ugly face on here first before the pretty face got up here to, to meet with you guys, but... Um, I trust that, that y'all enjoyed just having some time to worship and uh, our worship pastor leading it, and I'm grateful that we could do that. Um, but today's Easter. We all know what Easter's about. It's Resurrection Day, and this year, um, for Easter, we're going to start a new series called Arise. And the whole series is just going to be a study on the topic of resurrection. Now notice I said a study on the topic of resurrection, not of the resurrection. Now we will study Jesus' resurrection, but the whole series is focused around the topic of resurrection. And so in four or five weeks, we'll look at our future resurrection. And we'll look at what that looks like and how that's going to play out, and what our bodies will be like after we have resurrected. Um, because listen, if, you, if you're just like, well, I'm watching this because it's Easter and my aunt asked me to watch it or whatever, let me just explain to you as Christians, we believe that there is a resurrected life to be lived after death. And that life is built on Jesus' resurrection. Jesus says, because I live, you also will live. And so the message of scripture is a message of hope, really, because death isn't the end. Death is just a bridge that gets us from here into eternity. And the hope of that eternity is predicated on Jesus' resurrection. His resurrection guarantees our resurrection. And so we're going to look at our resurrection in four or five weeks. Uh, but before that, next week, we're going to look at Jesus' resurrection, and we're going to look at it forensically. In other words, we're gonna look at it like detectives and we're gonna to try to pull evidence and see um, if we can support this statement that Jesus rose from the dead. Can we support that and substantiate that with evidence? That'll be next week. And then the third week of this series, uh, we'll talk about the importance of Jesus' resurrection. Like, so what, what's it mean? Why is it important to us or to anybody? Um, but today, what we're gonna look at is we're just going to go through the story of Jesus' resurrection. It's just the simple, it's going to be story form. I didn't do any sermon notes today, so if you're online looking for them, you can get out of that. Uh, you can take your own notes, feel free, of course, but I didn't want to provide any, any uh, sermon notes today because it's just going to be in a simple story form. We're going to read and, and really just take in the resurrection of Jesus. And, and we want to really feel the resurrection of Jesus. Now, let, let me say this too. The resurrection of Jesus is the heart of Christianity. Okay, the, the Christian faith is a belief system that hinges on the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Okay, you cannot take the resurrection out of Christianity. If you do, it's not Christianity. And if you personally don't believe in, in Jesus' resurrection, you can't be a Christian. 
Now, you may falsely claim to be one, but if you do not believe in the resurrection, you are not Christian. And any kind of belief system that denies the resurrection of Jesus is at the core of it not Christian either. And uh, so uh, you hear some people say, well, I'm a Christian, but I don't believe in the resurrection. And then you have other people who just flat out don't believe it, and they try to explain away the resurrection. And that's really a sad stance to take because as you explain away the resurrection, you're actually explaining yourself right into eternity in hell. And the reason for that is because the only hope we have to make it to heaven with God for eternity is by Jesus' resurrection. So we're just going to look at that story today. So I'm going to have you turn to two places. Turn to John chapter 20 and mark your Bible when you get to John chapter 20. Then after you get there, flip over to Matthew 28. Matthew 28 is going to be our main text today. We will flip over to John 20 later in the sermon. And uh, we will also be pulling cross-references from Mark and Luke. So we're going to be in all the Gospels today. And we want to uh, just use the complementary information that Mark, Luke, and John give us. If our main text is Matthew 28, starting in verse 1, and we'll go through verse 10, then we will complement the story and build on the story with Mark, Luke, and John's accounts as well because they complement one another. They don't contradict one another. They complement one another. And so... As I said, the focus this morning is really just going to be on the the story, the simple but profound story of the resurrection of Jesus, okay? And and the one thing I want you to to notice as we're just going to flow right through the story, and as we do, I want you to notice one thing, and I'll be here along the way to kind of point it out to you, so don't be nervous about it, but I want you to notice the women's emotions, And like I said, as we go through the story, I'll point out the emotions that they're feeling at the particular times. And then at the end of the sermon, uh, we'll try to tie those emotions and that subject of those emotions back together. Okay? Matthew chapter 28, starting in verse 1, follow along with me in your Bible. It says, After the Sabbath at dawn on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to look at the tomb. There was a violent earthquake, for an angel of the Lord came down from heaven and, going to the tomb, rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning, and his clothes were white as snow. The guards were so afraid of him that they shook and became like dead men. The angel said to the women, Do not be afraid, for I know that you're looking for Jesus, who was crucified. He's not here. He has risen, just as he said. Come and see the place where he lay. Then go quickly and tell his disciples, He has risen from the dead, and he is going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him. Now I have told you. So the women hurried away from the tomb, afraid yet filled with joy, and ran to tell his disciples. Suddenly Jesus met them. Greetings, he said. They came to him, clasped his feet, and worshipped him. Then Jesus said to them, Do not be afraid. Go and tell my brothers to go to Galilee. There they will see me. Let's pray. Lord, this is your word, and your word is truth. And I pray that the simple yet profound resurrection story proclaimed today and celebrated today by those of us who know you, I pray that your word goes out powerfully. I pray that it changes lives. I I pray that that everyone who hears it, Lord, can take something in and we'll be able to glorify you and worship you at a deeper level. So, Lord, guide us in this time. Bless our time together and thank you for your word. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. All right, first, real quick, let's let's establish the time. Just starting back there in verse 1 of chapter 28, uh, the first phrase Matthew gives us is, after the Sabbath. After the Sabbath, if you're like, eh, I'm kind of new to church, I don't really know what Sabbath means, Kev. Uh, Sabbath is really a Jewish term, Shabbat is what they call it over in Israel. And uh, it was just a day of rest. And they practice a Sabbath every week. Uh, 2,000 years ago, they still do it now. And it's, it's the seventh day of the week is taken for a day of rest. And in case you're wondering, like, wonder why they would make it the seventh day of the week that they rested on. Well, that goes all the way back to Genesis 1-1 in creation. 
because God created for the first six days and then on the seventh day, he rested. And so the Jews patterned their weeks uh, just like the creation uh, idea there. And on the seventh day of the week in the Jewish custom, they rested. It was all about rest. They did no occupational work. They could only walk so far. Uh, it was all about rest and restoration and time in the word. This was the Sabbath. Now, the Sabbath started, they kind of did their days different than we do our days. We go from midnight to midnight is, is one day. Well, in Israel, it's a little bit different. And the Sabbath started actually Friday evening at sundown, and it ran all the way through Saturday evening at sundown. Um, we got to experience that. When we were over there a few months ago, uh, we were on our tour bus back to our hotel late Friday afternoon over in Israel, and our tour guide was like, he was like, hey, let me give you all just a tip for tonight. He was like, if you don't want to spend your whole night on an elevator, do not ride the Shabbat elevator. It's on the far right. And we were thinking, what's he talking about? Well, people in Israel, the Jewish people, believe that to, pr to get into an elevator on Sabbath and to press a button is considered work for them. So they have this special elevator called the Shabbat elevator. And every Friday evening at 6 until Saturday evening at 6, if you get on the Shabbat elevator, you stop at every floor. It's programmed to stop at every floor so that nobody will have to work and push the elevator button. So you just lose your whole night if you got on from the ground floor level and you were going to floor 18 because you'd stop at floor one, then you'd go to two, stop, open the door, nobody, close the door, up to level three, and so on and so forth. Uh, so the Sabbath was all about rest. And Matthew tells us here that it's after the Sabbath. So it's after Saturday evening at six o'clock. And he says, after the Sabbath, at dawn on the first day of the week. Now, another thing the Jews did is uh, they didn't name the days of the week. Uh, for us, we've got, you know, Sunday through Saturday and everything in between. For the Jews, they really didn't call days by a name. Uh, the Jews just referred to days numerically in reference to the Sabbath. And so our uh, Sunday would be day one to the Jews. Our Monday would be day two because Sabbath was on day seven, which is our Saturday. And so he tells us that it's after the Sabbath at the dawn of day one. So the, the setting in our minds now is early Sunday morning. After the Sabbath, which was ended Saturday evening at 6, at the dawn of the first day of the week, so we're at Sunday morning here, maybe 10 hours have passed, maybe 10, 11, 12 hours at most have passed since Sabbath has ended Saturday evening, and now we are uh, at dawn Sunday morning. Mark substantiates this when Mark in, in uh, his gospel in chapter 16, verse 2, says very early on the first day of the week. In Luke 24, 1, Luke says, on the first day of the week, very early in the morning. And then John is a little bit different. In John chapter 20, verse 1, John writes, early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark. So when we compile all these accounts, what we see is uh, these women started out, as John says, while it's still dark. And then the events at, at the tomb begin to play out as sun rises. And so they get to the tomb, and the sun rays start peeking over the Mount of Olives in the east. But they started out toward the tomb while it was still dark, right at dawn of Sunday morning. Now you say, why is this significant? Like, why did Matthew need to tell us that it was, you know, after the Sabbath at the dawn of the first day? Well, because it, it was very significant, because this is the third day that Jesus has been in the tomb. Okay? He was in the tomb part of Friday, all of Saturday, and then so many hours on Sunday. This is the third day. And you say, well, why is that significant? Well, because just in the Gospel of Matthew, four different times Jesus said that he would rise on the third day. So this day is significant. And he repeated that all through his ministry. So this is a key time as we open up in verse 1 in Matthew chapter 28, because according to Jesus... This is Resurrection Day. So we've established the time, early Sunday morning. 
Now let's meet the women that were headed to the tomb. They are still in verse 1. Matthew names Mary Magdalene and the other Mary. Okay? Um, now, just a little bit about these two Marys. They loved Jesus completely and immensely. And um, they traveled with Jesus. They followed Jesus. And in where we are now in Jerusalem, they had traveled from Galilee up north in Israel along with Jesus and his disciples, south all the way to the city of Jerusalem for the Passover. So they followed Jesus around. They know him. They've known him for a few years. Uh, they've came with him from Galilee down to Jerusalem. Uh, they cared for his needs. They were at the cross when he was crucified. If you stay in the book of Matthew and go backwards a chapter to Matthew chapter 27, verses 55 and 56 say, Many women were there referring to the cross where Jesus was hanging and where he died. Many women were there watching from a distance. They had followed Jesus from Galilee to care for his needs. Among them were Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James and Joseph, and the mother of Zebedee's sons. And so there we see that Mary and the other Mary were at the cross, but they were also at the burial. If you skip down to verse 61 in Matthew chapter 27, it says Mary Magdalene and the other Mary were sitting there opposite the tomb. So they witnessed Jesus on the cross, these two Marys did. They witnessed him um, breathe his last and die. And then they witnessed him being buried. And now, now we are, here we are, third day after he's been buried. And now here they are again at the tomb. Now, um, I want you to understand here, the first emotion that these women experienced is sadness. I mean, if you think about it, they've been following Jesus now for a couple, two, three years, and Jesus has been um, performing miracles, and he's healed sick people. He's made the wind and waves obey him. He has, uh, he's brought Lazarus back from the dead. They have seen him do so many miraculous things. He's fed 10 to 20,000 people with a few fish and a few loaves of bread, and, and he was their hope. See, in the Jewish tradition, they were looking for their Messiah, their king that was going to come and reign, and they put all their eggs in the Easter, not in the Easter basket. I'm still stuck on uh, searching for Easter eggs. They put all their eggs in the Jesus basket, and, and Jesus was their long-awaited Messiah, and they had all this hope in Jesus that he was going to deliver them politically from Rome. Well, when Jesus died, their hope died. And that was Friday. And the Bible's pretty silent on what they did Saturday, but I assume they probably were mourning Saturday. And then Sunday morning on the way to the tomb, they were experiencing this deep sadness and this loss. So kind of note that in your mind that the first emotion they experienced was sadness. You say, well, who are these women? Mary Magdalene and the other Mary. Well, Mary Magdalene is a woman Jesus met years earlier, and we know that she was possessed by seven demons, and Jesus drove out these demons. And when he did, she trusted in him and, and began to follow him. Now, the other Mary, uh, as referred to in chapter 27 of Matthew, is the mother of James and Joseph. So um, two other disciples that were following Jesus, their mom came along and began to follow Jesus as well. And so we've got Mary Magdalene and the other Mary, but they weren't alone. You say, well, that's all it says there in verse 1, Kev. Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to the tomb. Well, they weren't alone. This is where we have to look at a couple other of the gospel accounts. In Mark chapter 16, 1, Mark adds Salome or Salome, um, who was the mother of James and John, the two disciples of Jesus. She was married to Zebedee. So Mark 16.1 adds Salome in there, and then Luke 24.10 adds a woman named Joanna. Okay, so we've got Mary Magdalene, the other Mary, Salome, and Joanna. Now if you go to John 20, verse 1, John only focuses on Mary Magdalene, Okay. And you say, well, hold on, now this looks like it's contradicting one another. And this is not contradictory at all. This is very complimentary. 
Um, if you're taking account of somewhere you are at one time and uh, someone else who is also there takes an account or writes it down, odds are you probably won't list everybody that's there and they may list somebody that you didn't list and vice versa. That's not um, being contradictory, that's actually complementing each other and that's what we see here. John just focuses on Mary Magdalene, but if you were to continue to read in John 1 and 2, uh, you would see where John uh, quotes Mary, and Mary says, we don't know where they have put Jesus. We, meaning more than just her. And so John was aware that there was more than just Mary who headed out to the tomb here. So we've got the group here, Mary Magdalene, the other Mary, Joanna, and uh, Salome. So there's this whole group of women who get up and leave while it's still dark and they're headed to the tomb. Now, Mark 16, 3 gives us a little insight as well. Um, they didn't know how they were going to get the stone out of the entrance because we know that when Joseph and Nicodemus buried Jesus on Friday, that they rolled a huge stone down this slanted uh, little uh, lip in front of the tomb. And it was easy to roll the stone down in that little clip or lip there, but really hard to push it up out of there. And so these women are headed to the tomb and they start asking each other, well, who's gonna roll the stone away? I mean, we're headed there, but I, I don't know how the stone's gonna get uh, rolled away. They also didn't know that the tomb was being guarded by Roman soldiers. They didn't know that the tomb had been sealed where you couldn't get in. They didn't know any of this. They were just going back. Uh, the last thing they saw Friday was Jesus buried. They knew there was a stone there. They were concerned about how it would get rolled away. They didn't know anything about Roman guards or a seal being there uh, at the tomb. So they arrive as the sun begins to rise. And you say, well, what are they doing, Kev? Did they come to see the resurrection? I mean, is that what this group of women was doing, coming to see the resurrection? Answer, no. Look there in verse 1. After the Sabbath at dawn on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to look at the tomb. They didn't come to see a resurrection. And think about it. As many times as Jesus told them when he was alive, the Son of Man's going to be delivered over and murdered or crucified, and he'll rise again on the third day. Jesus told them that at least four times that we know of. And you would think as many times as he told them, that kind of would have stuck in their mind. But I just don't think they could understand it. I don't think that their faith could accept it and handle it. I just don't think they believed it. So they weren't going to the tomb to see the resurrection. You say, well, why were, why were they there then? Well, to see the tomb, and Mark 16, 1 gives us a little bit further information what they were doing was coming to the tomb and bringing spices so that they could anoint Jesus' body. You say, what are you talking about anoint his body? I mean, why would they do that? Well, because they didn't embalm 2,000 years ago, and a body would decay pretty quickly. And some of you that know the Bible are like, hold on a minute, I, I thought Jesus was already anointed. He was when Joseph of Arimathea and when Nicodemus took him down off the cross, as they wrapped him in linen cloth, they anointed his body with the Bible says like 75 pounds of spices before they put him in the tomb. But it's very hot over there, no embalming. And so they were coming to embalm his body one last time. They didn't come to see a resurrected Jesus. They came to anoint a corpse. And the Jews had a tradition and the Jewish tradition was that on the fourth day after death, that the body was so badly decayed that they believed that the spirit left from the body. So in other words, the first three days as the body was beginning to decay, the spirit kind of hung around in case something supernatural happened. But on the fourth day, the body was so badly decayed, the spirit left. And I wonder if Mary and Mary and Salome and Joanna didn't have that in mind. They knew it was the third day since he had been buried and they were gonna take spices and they were gonna anoint his body and show Jesus love and respect one last time before they believed that his body would be so badly decayed on the fourth day. 
So they wanted to reach out and extend that love and show their devotion to him one last time. So they go to anoint a corpse. They loved him, but they didn't believe that he was risen from the dead. You say, well, how could they not believe, man? Really? Well, before you just throw stones at this, this group of women for their lack of faith, you got to think, where are the disciples right now? At least this group of women is there wanting to show Jesus love and, and anoint his body one last time before his body was too badly decayed. And so they go to the tomb to look at the tomb and to anoint Jesus. And, and keep this in mind, the first emotion they experienced on their way there was sadness, great, deep pain and sadness. Now let's look at what happened at the tomb. Starting in verse two, it says there was a violent earthquake. There's an earthquake. Now we know this is the second earthquake in three days because there was a great earthquake when Jesus died. And now three days later, here's another earthquake. And so as this group of women are walking up and approaching the tomb, there's this earthquake. And the epicenter of the earthquake is at the tomb. And it rocks the land where these women are walking. And you say, well, what? Oh, okay, well, what, what caused the earthquake? Oh, the resurrection caused the earthquake. Wrong answer. The resurrection didn't cause the earthquake. If you read in verse 2, it says, There was a violent earthquake, for an angel of the Lord came down from heaven. So the resurrection didn't cause the earthquake. The angel that came down from heaven is what caused the earthquake. He hit the ground in the garden, and as he hit the ground, it caused a huge earthquake. You say, well, I thought they were... So who saw the resurrection then, Kev? Answer is nobody. Nobody saw Jesus get up in the tomb and go out of the tomb. The women, as they were approaching the tomb, experienced an earthquake when the angel came. What was the angel doing there? Well, it says he came down from heaven and going to the tomb, he rolled back the stone and sat on it. So he was there to move the stone. You say, oh, okay, I, I think I kind of get it now, Kev. The angel came, caused an earthquake. He was there to roll the stone away and open the tomb out, open the tomb. So, oh, to let Jesus out. But listen, we have to understand this. The angel didn't move the stone away from the entrance to let Jesus out, okay? I mean, to me, it's pretty silly to think that Jesus would have enough power to raise himself back from the dead and then have to stand in the tomb and wait for somebody to open the, 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 the entrance of it. No, the angel didn't come to move the stone so that Jesus could get out. The angel came to move the stone so that the women could get in and see that Jesus was resurrected and that he wasn't there anymore. You say, well, hold on, Kev, how... Well, how did Jesus get out of there if the stone was still there? I mean, he resurrected. How, how did he get out of the tomb? Well, probably the same way that he came into the upper room in John chapter 20, verse 26. He came right through a wall. Jesus in his glorified body had no problem uh, just going right through a wall. And I assume that he went right through this rock just like he did in John chapter 20. So the angel came, caused an earthquake. He rolled the stone away so that the women could get in. And so that later the disciples could get in. And so that later the world could get in. So that we could get in and see Jesus isn't here anymore. So these women, women walk through an earthquake, they arrive at the garden, and then they see the tomb open. Now at this point, we've got to go to John chapter 20. If you'll flip over there or follow along on the screen, and let's, let's put the accounts together. John says in John chapter 20, verses 1 and 2, remember John's focused on Mary Magdalene. Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb and saw that the tomb and uh, the stone had been removed from the entrance. So she came running to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one Jesus loved. Now he's referring to himself there, John is. Uh, so she runs to Simon Peter and to John, and she says, they've taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we don't know what they, where they've put him. So as these women, including Mary Magdalene, approach the tomb, they see that the stone is rolled away from the entrance of the tomb, and before Mary Magdalene can see anything else, she splits. 
She runs back. She's got to find Peter and John. She just assumes somebody has stolen the body of Jesus. That wasn't exactly uh, what happened. Mary was pretty impulsive. What Peter was to the disciples, Mary Magdalene was to the women who followed Jesus. Kind of the leader, pretty impulsive, uh, kind of did things without thinking. That's how Peter was. That's how Mary is. Um, because I would think when they walk up and notice that the stone is rolled away from the entrance of the tomb, I would think, hey, did Mary not see that angel sitting on the stone? And I don't believe that she did. I think she just walked up, saw that the stone was rolled away, and immediately assumed somebody had stolen his body. I think she freaked out and took off running back to Peter and John to report to them what she thought had happened. So while Mary runs back to meet them, the other women in the group stay there at the tomb, and they see an angel. Verse 3, we get his description. His appearance was like lightning. In the Greek, it means his face. His countenance was like lightning. And that means flashing, brilliant, uh, blazing. We would call this the glory of God. It's the glow of God. For people who've been in the Bible for a while and you know your way around church doctrine, we call this the Shekinah glory of God the glow of God. And God's glory had transmitted from God himself to this angel. And so his face is glowing. Notice it says, and his clothes were white as snow. Now the whiteness of his clothes symbolizes purity, symbolizes holiness. And so this is a holy messenger angel sent from the face of God to the tomb to give them a message. And I like how he's just hanging out. I like how he's just hanging out. He's like, yeah, he's just sitting on the stone. So he comes down, he causes an earthquake, he moves the stone away, and as he rolls it out of its place, I can just see it falling over, and then they walk up, and he's just hanging out, sitting there on it. Can't, can't you see him just kind of kicking his legs? Face shining, clothes bright, white, and, and had to be pretty terrifying, because look there in verse 4. The guards were so afraid of him that they shook and became like dead men. So the guards were shook, right? Now these, these weren't just, you know, piddly little nobodies here. These were Roman soldiers. It was at least four, probably more like 16, and maybe even as many as 50. So there's multiple Roman killing machines hanging out at the tomb just to make sure there's no funny business going on. See, the Jewish leaders uh, went to the Roman leader and was like, hey, this guy that we killed yesterday, he said that he was going to rise again on the third day, so can you send or dispatch a whole guard of your Roman soldiers over there to guard the tomb to make sure nobody shows up and steals the body or there's no kind of funny business or silliness with it? And so this Roman guard has been keeping watch now for a whole day and night, taking turns. One would, or three would sleep, one would watch over uh, the place, make sure nobody was coming. He'd do his time, he'd lay down and sleep, another one would get up. And so they were guarding this tomb. It was very secure until an angel shows up. And as he lands in the garden, he causes an earthquake, and then the earth stopped quaking, but the guards didn't stop. Because <laughs> it said the guards were so afraid of him that they shook and became like dead men. They had their own personal little earthquakes when they saw uh, this angel. They were there to make sure nothing happened, but they could not stop God doing what God was going to do. They shook and became like dead men. That means they were knocked unconscious, strictly out of terror. You know fear can do that? Seriously, did you know fear can cause people to be paralyzed to the point where they go unconscious? That's exactly what happened to this Roman guard, this, this, this troop of Roman soldiers. The angel comes, hits down in the garden, causes an earthquake. They freak out, fall over in terror, unconscious. They experienced something so incomprehensible that it shook them physically and emotionally. So what about the women? Were they scared? 
Uh, I'd say so because verse 5, the first thing the angel says to him is don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. So that's the second emotion they've experienced in this story so far. First, sadness on the way to the tomb. And then once they get there and experience this angel, they experience fear. They move from sadness to fear. But look how loving the angel comforts them. Don't be afraid. He didn't comfort the Roman guard. He did comfort God's people. Don't, don't be afraid. By the way, that's common in Scripture to see an angel telling a human being not to fear. He knew while they were there. You're here to see Jesus. You're looking for Jesus who was crucified. Now remember, at this point, Mary Magdalene's running back to find Peter and John to tell them somebody's stolen his body. Remember, they were there to anoint a corpse, not to see a resurrection. They had no faith in the resurrection at this point. And I want you to stop and I want you to consider God's grace right there. God could have said, well, you know, my son told them at least four times he was going to rise on the third day and they didn't believe him, so let's do away with them. Forget it. But God wasn't. He's so patient and he's so gracious. And he sends his angel to give a gracious, loving, comforting uh, remark to them. Don't be scared. I know you're here looking for Jesus who was crucified. What's he say? He's not here. He is risen, just as he said. He is risen. Now, the Greek right there indicates that that means and implies that he was risen from the dead. Now, there's some skeptics of Christianity who want to say, well, you know, the whole Jesus rising from the dead thing, that didn't really happen. He just got beat really bad and knocked unconscious and they threw him in a grave. And then after a day or so in the good coolness of the grave, he kind of woke up and, and kind of walked out of the grave. That's never been history's story. Somebody made that up uh, to, try to, to try to spoil the truth of the resurrection, but that is not truth. And we see here, there's no question Jesus was dead, but he's not anymore. The angel says he's not here. He is risen. He is risen. I, I've always thought it was neat that throughout the New Testament, you'll see references that Jesus was raised by God the Father. You'll see references that Jesus raised himself. In Romans, it talks about the Spirit raising Jesus. And I think it's just a really neat thing to see the whole trinity involved in raising the second person of the trinity. God himself, one being, raised the second person of the trinity, Jesus Christ. So he's risen. He's risen. Just as he said. Like, don't you remember? You're looking for Jesus, but he's not here. He's risen. Just, just as he said. Luke 24, 8 uh, lets us know that that when they heard this, they remembered his words. So these women are standing there talking to an angel, hanging out on the stone. The angel's like, I know why you're here. I know why you're here. You're here to anoint Jesus. You're here to see Jesus who was crucified, but he's not here. He's risen. Don't you remember? And Luke 24, 8 says at that time they remembered. They were like, oh yeah, he did say something about that. And they started putting two and two together. And then the angel goes a step further and he's like, hey, won't you, won't you check it out? Won't you, won't you come in? Come and see the place where he lay there in verse 6. Come and see where he lays. At this time, Luke 24 verse 4 tells us that the first angel is now joined by a second angel who is in the tomb. So one angel outside greeting, uh, hanging out on the stone, second angel in the tomb. They got instructions from the angel in verse 7. Then go quickly and tell his disciples, he's risen from the dead and is going ahead of you to Galilee. There you will see him. Now I've told you. So now I want you to go and tell the disciples what's up. You came here looking to anoint a corpse, but I'm telling you that Jesus is risen. He's alive. Go tell the disciples what's happened. One commentator I read this week, I love this, said, fascination turned to proclamation. And in my mind, I'm sitting here thinking, you know, if, 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 I mean, I'm, I'm not an angel. But if I were this angel, I probably would have been tempted to be like, man, pff, don't tell the disciples what happened. They aren't even here. 
You group of women had enough faith and love and devotion to come and anoint Jesus' body, and the disciples are sitting scared in their houses. If it were me, I would have said, don't even tell the disciples. Let them go a week before they know. Uh, but again, God is gracious and patient and loving, and the angel sends this group of women back to Jesus' disciples to tell them that he's risen from the dead. So the women learn of the, the resurrection. Now, if you think about it, they had a whole lot of evidence to conclude that the resurrection had actually happened. They got there and the tomb was empty. Uh, the guards were unconscious. They had a testimony from an angel that he had risen. And then when they looked in the tomb, they saw Jesus' grave clothes undisturbed. They knew that the disciples didn't believe in a resurrection, so it wouldn't have been that the disciples came and stole the body in order to falsify a resurrection. They had all this evidence that it actually happened, but the angel tells them, you're going to get the ultimate evidence of it because he says in verse 7, go to Galilee, there you'll see him. So not only do you have all this evidence, this circumstantial evidence built up here for the women, but you're going to be eyewitnesses of his resurrection in Galilee. So we see what happened at the tomb. Now let's see what happened when they left the tomb. Starting in ver verse 8. The angel told them, go back to the disciples, tell them what's up. Verse 8, so the women hurried away from the tomb, afraid yet filled with joy, and ran to tell the disciples. Now note this real quick before we move on. Here's the third emotion. Fear was tempered with joy. They ran away from the tomb, afraid, yet filled with joy. So now joy comes in, and the news of the resurrection has produced this great sense of joy in the hearts of all these women. And so they're headed to tell the disciples what had happened. And according to Luke chapter 24, uh, verses 9 through 11, this is kind of funny and so real to me. I mean, you would think, you know, if the Bible was fake, they'd leave stuff out of it like this. But it says when they, the women, came back from the tomb, they told all these things to the 11 disciples. You're like, I thought there were 12. Well, Judas is gone by this time. He's hung himself. So they get back and they tell all these things. They tell exactly what they, what they experienced and witnessed at the tomb. They told it to the 11 Luke tells us again who was there, Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Mary the mother of James, and the others with them told the apostles. Look in verse 11. The disciples were like, yes, he's risen. Not really. Verse 11, but they did not believe the women because their words seemed to them like nonsense. I mean, for real, don't you think if the Bible was fake, they just left this part out? that Jesus' disciples, his closest friends and followers, didn't believe that he had rose again, even after the women who had been following Jesus testified of it. They didn't believe. Meanwhile now, now remember, Mary Magdalene at this point has found Peter and John, and they're on their way back to the tomb. So Mary Magdalene goes initially to the tomb with the other women, but when she gets there, she freaks out, runs back to get John and Peter. The other women have the experience with the angel, and they leave. Well, as they leave, Mary Magdalene, John, and Peter are on their way back to the tomb. And when they get there, the soldiers are still unconscious, the tomb's still open, and uh, the angel's still there when they arrive. So now if you flip over to John chapter 20, we'll see what happened with Mary Magdalene, Peter, and John. John says in John 20, starting in verse 4, uh, both were running, talking about himself and Peter. Both were running, but the other disciple outran Peter. So John felt the need to tell us he's faster than Peter. Okay? Both were running to the tomb, but John outran Peter, and he reached the tomb first. Now notice what John did. He bent over and looked into the tomb at the strips of linen lying there, but he didn't go in. John's a little hesitant. He gets to the tomb first. Hold up. Soldiers are laying here. The tomb's open. This looks a little fishy. John's a little hesitant to go in. He does bend down and look in and see the grave clothes there. I mean, you got to think about it. From John's perspective, the only information that he has is from this point on is, is from Mary Magdalene. And she's told him somebody's stolen the body of Jesus. 
So John hesitates a little bit. He doesn't go in the tomb. He kind of stoops down and, and looks in and he sees the clothes and he's probably a little confused and he's apprehensive to just burst right into the tomb. Peter, on the other hand, is totally the opposite. John gets there and he just bends down and looks, but he doesn't go in. Verse 6 in John 20 says, Then Simon Peter came along behind him and went straight into the tomb. I mean, can't you just see Peter almost like just running straight into the tomb? He probably almost knocked poor John over because John's there at the opening. And I'm telling you, I've been to the garden tomb in Jerusalem and, and not much room to get in there. So if John was there uh, looking in and Peter just runs right past him and runs in, probably almost knocks John over. And Peter sees the clothes and he sees this strange thing. Jesus' grave clothes are, are left in the same place they were when they laid Jesus' body down. I mean, in other words, they were undisturbed. If somebody would have came in and stolen the body of Jesus, they would have either taken the grave clothes with them or they would have unwrapped them and thrown them down and taken his naked body. So it's really striking to Peter that, oh my goodness, here are the grave clothes exactly how they were when they buried Jesus. So as Peter goes in, John goes in, and it says John believes. John believes in verse 8. Finally, the other disciple who had reached the tomb first also went inside. He followed Peter in. He saw and believed. John had such a heart of faith. Now, Peter probably had a million questions about what was going on at this point, but John saw and believed. They still didn't understand from the scriptures that Jesus had to rise from the dead. Then the disciples went back to where they were staying. So get the picture. Peter, John, Mary running to the tomb. John gets there first, gets a peek. Peter runs right past John, probably runs over him, sees it. Then John goes in and believes, and they both walk out of the tomb. And then Peter and John leave the tomb, and Mary Magdalene still hangs around, though. If you continue on there in John 20... Starting verse 11, it says, Mary stood outside the tomb crying. As she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb. Now you're like, why is everybody bending over to look at the tomb? The entrance is not very high. I mean, again, you're looking may, maybe, maybe four foot high, maybe. So you would have to stoop down and look in before you walked in. So Peter and John hit the trail. John believes Jesus is risen. Peter's probably questioning it. Mary hangs out at the tomb, and she goes over and looks into the tomb. Now think about this. Mary lingered at the cross. Mary lingered at his burial. Now Mary's lingering at the tomb on the third day, and she's crying. Verse 12 tells us what she saw. She saw two angels in white seated where Jesus' body had been, one at the head and other at the foot. So now here are these two angels that the other women had experienced when they walked in the tomb. Now I think this is interesting. If, if you know anything about the Old Testament and the Ark of the Covenant, think about this. This was a square box overladen with gold and in the middle on top of the box was the mercy seat where the blood was uh, dripped on uh, for the forgiveness of sin. What was on either end of the top of the Ark of the Covenant almost protecting or covering the mercy seat? There's an angel. And so we literally see a visual picture of Jesus in, where, the, where he was in the tomb was the mercy seat with two angels there, one at where his head was, one at where his feet were. And she sees these two angels and then they start to interact with her in verse 13. They ask her, woman, what, why are you crying? What's wrong? And it's funny to me because Mary just replies like it's nothing. So Mary's like 0 for 3 so far on recognizing angels. When she first ran up to the tomb with a group of women, she didn't see the angels sitting on the stone. She goes and gets Peter and John, comes back, walks into the tomb. There's two angels sitting there, and they're like, why are you crying? She just replies straight up. She just still doesn't recognize that they're angels. She said, they've taken my Lord. Somebody, I mean, somebody's taken my Lord away, and I don't know where they've put him. And so she tells him why she's crying. And then verse 14 says, at this, she turned around to look outside the tomb 
And it says that she saw Jesus standing there. But look, she didn't recognize Jesus. She didn't realize that it was Jesus. And you may be thinking, well, how did she not know it was Jesus standing there? Well, because if you continue to study the Gospels, after Jesus arose, no one recognized him until he opened their eyes. Think about Luke 24 and the two disciples walking out of Jerusalem on the road to Emmaus. They walked miles with Jesus and never recognized it was Jesus until they sat down to eat and Jesus opened their eyes so that they recognized him. And it was the same here with Mary. And in verse 15, Jesus says to her, woman, why are you crying? Who is it that you're looking for? Look what it says. Thinking he was the gardener, Mary replies to Jesus, sir, if you've, if you've carried him away, tell me where you've put him and I'll get him. In other words, hey, you've been here working on this garden. If this tomb here was only for rent and it was only available for Jesus' body to be in here for a couple, two or three days and you all have taken him somewhere, would you just let me know and I'll go get him and I'll give him a proper burial? Verse 16, Jesus said to her, look, one word, Jesus said, Mary. And at that Jesus opened her eyes. I don't know if it was the tone of his voice. I don't know if he just supernaturally opened her eyes so that she recognized him as he spoke her name, as he said, Mary. And she turned toward him and cried out in Aramaic. Her, uh, actually her and Jesus, uh, natural language there, Aramaic, and she cries out Rabboni, which means teacher. It means master. And so Jesus reveals himself to her and she was the first person to see the resurrected Christ. Mark 16, 9 tells us that. When Jesus rose early on the first day of the week, he appeared first to Mary Magdalene, out of whom he had driven seven demons. And so the whole group of women come up, see the tomb. Mary runs back and gets Peter and John. These women have a conversation with an angel. They leave. Peter, John, and Mary come back. Peter and John uh, see the angels and leave. Mary hangs out, and then there at the tomb, Mary is the first person to see the risen Jesus. And what does she do there back in John chapter 20? She throws herself on him, and, 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 and she, she hugs him, and, and Jesus says, Don't hold on to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father. And so Mary's like, I've lost you once. I don't want to lose you again. And so she's holding on tight to him. And Jesus says, hold on, I, I can't stay right now. I, I can't stay with you forever. I have to ascend to the Father. Now we know Jesus didn't ascend on Easter day, right? He walked around for like 40 days and uh, revealed himself to people. But this is a microcosm of, no, don't ever leave me again. And Jesus is saying, no, I, I can't stay. And then he tells her, I have to ascend to the Father, my God and your God. Go to my brothers and tell them that I'm ascending to the Father. And so Mary goes to the disciples and she tells them the news. I've seen the Lord. And she told them that he had said these things to her. So she reports her experience to the disciples. So we've got the timeline. Let's go back to Matthew 28 in verse 9 as we wrap up. So the, all the women go to the tomb. Mary leaves early. These women experience the angels and leave. Mary, John, and Peter come back. John and Peter leave. And then Mary experiences and sees the risen Christ. Back to verse 9 in Matthew chapter 28. After Mary has experienced the risen Christ, suddenly Jesus met this other group of women as they were on their way back to tell the disciples. So Jesus goes from being at the tomb, there with Mary Magdalene, to an instant now he is with this group of other women that were headed back to tell the disciples what had happened. And look what he says to them. Suddenly Jesus met them. Greetings, he said. Now in the Greek, this is a really common term. It just means hi, hello. I mean, just think, this is the Son of God who just rose from the dead. I would think he would say something more profound than showing up and going, what's up? But this was just a common term used in the marketplace there in Israel. And so we see Jesus' humanity still, soft, comforting. Hey, guys. 
They knew who he was. Look what they did. Verse 9, they came to him, clasped his feet, and worshipped him. They worshipped. They knew he was God in human flesh. They knew he was dead three days ago, and now he had risen. They had seen the empty tomb. They had seen his grave clothes. They had heard the angel's testimony, but now they are seeing the risen Jesus, and they're hearing the risen Jesus, and they're touching the risen Jesus. By the way, they touched the risen Jesus. Mary Magdalene at the tomb touched the risen Jesus. This lets us know that this was not some ghost or apparition or something that these women dreamed up. They touched him. He physically rose from the dead and out of the grave. Then they get their instructions from Jesus. Verse 10, he says, don't be afraid. Go and tell my brothers to go to Galilee. There they will see me. So go to Galilee. This has been the message from the angel. This is the message from Jesus. He reminded them what he told them before he died. I'm going to rise and then you'll see me in Galilee. So he says, tell them to go to Galilee. And there they will see me. That's the fourth emotion. Hope. They will. That's future. They will see me in Galilee. So these women have went from sadness to fear, to joy, to hope. And their hope was very clear. We're going to see him again in Galilee. Now this is the end of Matthew's simple account of the resurrection. This is, it's really simple. Matthew's not trying to convince you this happened. This is just matter of fact how it did happen. And so as we end this, uh, we see that there's different ways to respond to the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Let me, let me give you a few. Some people respond to the resurrection with doubt. And they question the resurrection. They're a little skeptical. They look at it with a kind of a crooked eye. And, and, and there's honest doubters. People who are truly seeking out the truth and looking for the truth. But then there's also, also hypocritical doubters. And they're skeptical even after the evidence has made it clear that it's true. But some people respond in doubt. Other people respond to the resurrection of Jesus and they reject it because of rationalism. Now rationalism says that the mind of man is ultimate. Therefore, if the mind of man is ultimate, then only what man can perceive and explain can be true. And since the resurrection is inexplicable by human reason, well then it just didn't happen. I mean, if it can't fit into human reason, then it didn't happen. And so some people reject the resurrection because they hold to rationalism. Some people respond to the resurrection in indifference. They say, well, you know, I mean, that may be true, but to be honest with you, I just don't care. I mean, if it is, great. If it's not, great. Uh, but it really doesn't have anything to do with my agenda or how I'm living my life. And, and you know, it's not a priority to me. And, and I'm just really not interested either way, whether it's true or not. They respond in indifference. Other people respond with hostility. Some people get mad <laughs> and they, they put forth this loud effort to try to disprove uh, the resurrection. Then you have other people that reject it out of convenience. And what I mean by that is they don't want the resurrection to be true because if it's true, then Jesus is who he says he is and these people want to do what they want to do and not be held accountable for their actions by the judge that's living. So they just reject the resurrection out of convenience. But I pray that everybody watching this morning and listening uh, responds in this last way with faith. They believe the resurrection. They, they believe and affirm that it occurred and then they apply the reality of the resurrection to their lives. Those are the ways that you can respond to the resurrection. Now listen, God knows every heart. God knows whether you believe in the resurrection of Jesus Christ or not. And Romans 10 tells us, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, and you believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, then you will be saved. See, being a Christian is believing in the resurrection of Jesus and then receiving the resurrected Jesus as your Lord and Savior. Have you done that? If not, you should do it today. 
Now, as we conclude, I want you to look at these four emotions that these women experienced. One more time. Sadness, fear, joy, hope. And right now, in the climate of the world, really, there are many people experiencing sadness. We're isolated. Some people are very lonely. Some people have lost their job, lost their income. There's been some babies born and no family members can come to the hospital and see them because of the, the social distancing thing. And this is just a sad time for a lot of people. I looked this up and did, did you know that a few short weeks ago, I think on March 27th, right here in Knox County, I'm not even talking about all over the world, this is right here at home. Right here in Knox County, there were nine suicides two weeks ago. At that time, that was more deaths than the number of COVID deaths in the state of Tennessee at that time. Two weeks ago, there were six COVID deaths, and in a span of two weeks, there were nine suicides in Knox County. It's because people are hopeless, and they're sad, and they're depressed, and they're entering despair. They're hurting, they're alone. Many are sad. Many people are fearful. And the stress of bad news as you watch the evening news or you read headlines online and the fear of contracting this virus and the fear of, well, what's going to happen with my job? And people are fearing what's going to happen in the future to our nation, to our state, to our community, to my family. And there's a lot of fear that's prevalent right now. Many people's lives are dictated by fear. They're paralyzed because of the fear that comes with this virus. And people aren't in control like they think. And they know it now. They know that they're not in control and that produces a fear. So just like these women, some of you are experiencing sadness. Some of you are experiencing fear. But let me, let me make you a promise. Once the resurrection of Jesus Christ invades your life, then like these women, you can move from sadness and fear to joy and hope. Because joy and hope only comes from a relationship with the risen Jesus Christ. He is our joy. He is our hope. He is the source of those things. So if you're paralyzed with fear, if you're sad and, and in despair or you've been depressed, I would love to invite you to come to know the resurrected Jesus Christ. All you have to do is trust that he died for your sin and that he rose again on the third day. That's what Easter's all about. If you'll trust in Jesus' work, then you can be reconciled to God. He'll wipe your sin slate clean and you can be in a loving relationship that produces joy and hope. Christians, we don't have to live in sadness and fear. And I know even after you've received Jesus as your Lord and Savior, you can be paralyzed by fear. And some of you are. And some of you are truly Christians and, and you are so depressed and, and you're, you're sliding downward toward despair. And I'm telling you, you don't have to be there. We know the resurrected Jesus and he is the source of our joy. He is the source of our hope. Listen, our hope is not in a vaccine. And I'm all for it. I'm all for treating this disease and this sickness and all that. But I'm telling you, our hope stretches far beyond any kind of cure for an illness right now. Our hope is outside of this world. Our hope is going to be realized at the point of death. Jesus said, because I live, you will live. That's our hope. That's our joy. And so Christians, let's remember that as we live on through this super strange time in the world right now as, as we're battling this coronavirus thing. Joy and hope come from the resurrected Jesus. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you that as I bow my head right now, as I close my eyes right now and as I speak, I'm not speaking to a dead man who can't hear, whose bones are still in the ground. 
I'm speaking to a resurrected Jesus. One who is fully man and fully God, and you displayed that, Lord, through your life, through your death, and through your resurrection. And Lord, we celebrate today. You are our hope, Jesus. You are our joy. And that transcends our circumstances, Lord. We can have joy and hope no matter what's going on around us. And I am so thankful for that, Jesus. I'm so thankful that you died for my sin. And I believe that you have risen. Just as the angel said, you're not here. He's risen. And you are king and you are reigning and you are ruling and you will come back one day, Jesus. And my hope is to be with you. And I pray that your word would inspire those that are listening, that are watching to press into a relationship with you, Jesus. Risen, risen for our salvation, risen for our new life, risen for our joy, risen for our hope. We love you, we praise you, and we wanna celebrate that today, Lord, and not just today, but every day of our lives. Thank you so much for doing that. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Guys, if you, if you need to get a hold of us here at the church, feel free to look at our Harvest Point Church at Valley Grove Facebook page. Uh, you can send an info or an email to info at harvestpointchurch.net um, and get a hold of us. We'd love to hear from you. Uh, we're thinking about you. We're praying for you. We love you. Hopefully we get to see you guys on uh, Wednesday night at 7 on Easy Talks for our Bible study. Love you guys. Happy Easter. Hey, thanks for watching today. We pray that the Lord was glorified and that he spoke directly to you. Uh, if it was a blessing to you, I'm sure it'll probably be a blessing for others. So feel free to share it. And uh, if you'd like to give and support our ministry here at Harvest Point, you can go to harvestpointchurch.net and click on the Give tab. Thank you.